Hey everybody, Swayze here, and in today's video, we are going to be discussing over 30 cool and interesting features specific to this 2021 Ford Mustang Mach-E GT Performance Edition. This is the most top of the line Mustang Mach-E that you can purchase, and that's what we're gonna be discussing today. Now, keep in mind, if you are in the market for maybe a lower trim level Mustang Mach-E, some of the features I discuss in today's video are still applicable to those other models, so I suggest you stick around till the end because you may learn something new in today's video. Now, before we get started, I wanna give a a huge thank you and shout out to Ken Garf West Valley Ford for giving me the opportunity to review this beautiful vehicle for today. Now, unfortunately, this particular vehicle is not for sale. It has already been sold, but if you guys are in the market for a Mustang Mach-E, make sure you reach out to Ken Garf West Valley Ford. I'm gonna put their information down in the description below. Let them know that Swayze sent you and I'm sure they're gonna hook you up with a fantastic vehicle. All right, let's get started and talk about over 30 cool and interesting features specific to the Mustang Mustang Mach-E GT Performance. First and foremost, I wanna talk about what I like to call the meat and potatoes. And what I mean by that is we talk about the technical specs, the horsepower, the range, all of the things that you should probably consider if you're looking at purchasing one of these vehicles. Now, first let's talk about MSRP. Uh, and that gets a little tricky because it really depends on what trim level and model you get. The Ford Mustang Mach-E regular select version starts at just shy of $44,000. But if you're looking for something a little bit more more premium, something closer to this, the GT, which comes with the most amount of horsepower, that vehicle starts at just shy of $62,000. Now, if you're looking at something a little bit more spirited, a little bit more powerful, well, then you get this GT Performance Edition, which this particular vehicle is equipped with, and that costs a $6,000 premium, bringing the purchase price just shy of $68,000. Now, is that Performance Edition package worth it? Well, that's what we're gonna discuss in today's video, but but keep in mind that this vehicle still qualifies for the $7,500 federal tax credit. So if you're looking at a GT Performance Edition, well, when you take out that $7,500, you're closer to 60 grand for this vehicle and Tesla no longer qualifies for that $7,500 tax credit. So you're technically getting this vehicle at a discount compared to some of its competitors. Now, I will say as a result of supply constraints and such high demand, you can really only get this vehicle in two trim levels. That is the Select, which is the base cheapest version of the Mach-E and the GT and that's it you can no longer get the premium or the California Route 1 edition those two vehicles are in such high demand that they have stopped allowing new orders of those vehicles so you're just left with looking at existing inventory if any is left okay so let's talk about what performance and power specs come with this GT and the GT performance edition now if you're getting just the regular GT you get 480 horsepower and a whopping 600 pound-feet of torque now that will propel you from zero to 60 in about 3.8 seconds but this vehicle is actually even more powerful than that because this comes with the performance edition package and that allows you to get 480 horsepower so the same as the GT but a whopping 634 pound-feet of torque and that actually propels you from zero to 60 in 3.5 seconds so this is technically the quickest Ford Mustang you can buy and it's a crossover SUV now I do quickly want to mention the specs of the lower trim levels of this vehicle you can actually get this vehicle with as low as 266 horsepower and 317 pound-feet of torque all the way up to this 480 and 634 and in terms of zero to 60, it goes from as high as 6.1 seconds down to the 3.5 seconds I just noted on this GT Performance Edition. But still impressive figures to keep in mind considering this vehicle with tax credits on the base version goes for the high $30,000 range. All right, now let's talk about the elephant in the room, which is range and range anxiety. So how many miles can you actually get in this Mach-E GT? Well, the regular Mach-E GT without the Performance Edition, that one can actually go 200 and 70 miles on a complete charge. Now, this GT Performance Edition actually sacrifices a little bit when it comes to range. As a result of the additional torque, the additional power, you actually get 260 miles of range, so you do sacrifice about 10 miles. Now, that really depends on what environment you're in, what the temperature is at, and as an example, this one is charged to 100% and was showing just shy of 200 miles here on this 
pretty windy day where the temperature is in the 40 degrees. So keep that in mind when you're looking at the range figures. That's like the most ideal conditions, but you can get approximately 200 miles. Now you may be wondering what are the other options if you choose to get maybe the Select or if you happen to find a premium or a California Route 1 edition. Well, you can get the range all the way down to as low as 211 miles all the way up to 317 miles depending on which trim level you pick. I recommend you check out the Ford website to see which specific trim level offers what specific range. But just so you're aware, the GT and the GT Performance both come with a 91 kilowatt battery. Okay, now let's talk about charge times, which is probably the second biggest elephant in the room. Now, Ford says if you use the Ford connected charge station that has 240 volts and 48 amps, that charger will charge this vehicle from zero to 100 in just about 11 hours. So if you do have one of those at home, which Ford sells you for just shy of 800 bucks, then you can plug this vehicle in after work and then likely the next morning, it will be at 100% charge. Now, if you are on a road trip and you do happen to find a DC fast charger, which are available and you can find those using the infotainment screen on the inside, well, that will actually get you from 10% all the way up to 80% in about 45 minutes. So really not that bad and after 80% Ford does slow down the charging to maintain the integrity of the battery. So if you're trying to get it up to 100%, it's going to take a lot longer than that. But 10 to 80% is really where you should keep the battery at. So just enough time for you to use the restroom, grab a bite to eat, and then get back in the car and go another 200 or so miles. Now, one disadvantage that this vehicle has compared to the Tesla Model Y is this vehicle is not recommended for towing. So if you are looking to tow something with this vehicle, well, then you probably should look for a different electric vehicle vehicle, perhaps the F-150 Lightning, because this vehicle is just not designed for that. Now, if we're talking about weight, this is a pretty heavy vehicle. This is just around 5,000 pounds. Now, every single GT and GT Performance model comes with all-wheel drive, and it's really an electric all-wheel drive, or e-all-wheel drive is how Ford calls it, because it's just a dual motor setup. So what Ford did is it just took the regular rear-wheel drive motor that it has on the basic versions and threw that up front. Now, as standard with electric electric vehicles, this does not have a transmission. So for that reason, you're able to get a pretty flat loading floor in the back. The nice thing is if you live in climates like this on this particularly windy day, as you can see with the American flag back there is Ford offers all wheel drive on every single trim level of the Mustang Mach-E, but if you choose to get the GT, it comes standard with all wheel drive. And what I will say is this vehicle needs all wheel drive because there is so much torque. There is so much power going through this vehicle that rear wheel drive is just not going to cut it. It's going to be similar to a Hellcat where it's just going to burn out if it did not have all wheel drive. Now this particular paint color is about a $795 option and it's called Cyber Orange. And I got to say, this is probably one of the coolest colors to get this vehicle in. It gives it this aggressive, cool Mustang look to it. Now, when it comes to safety, as I'm sure you're curious when you're buying a four-door crossover SUV, this is actually an IIHS top safety pick. So no need to worry about safety when you're driving the Mustang Mach-E. Just so you know, in terms of warranty, this vehicle comes with a three-year, 36,000 mile basic warranty, just like every other vehicle. And since this doesn't really have a powertrain, Ford actually warranties the battery for up to eight years and 100,000 miles. It will guarantee that it will maintain at least a 70% life or Ford will replace the battery for you. Okay, now let's get into some of the cool features and the first thing we're gonna have to do is get underneath the hood. Now there's actually two ways to do that. One of them is to pull on this hood latch two times and the other is using the Ford Pass app using your phone. So what is under this hood you may ask since this is an electric vehicle with no internal combustion engine? Well, it is a giant frunk. Yes, I think Ford did a fantastic job by adding this frunk space into the front hood. Not all other electric competitors do that. For example, the Kia EV6 and the Hyundai Ioniq 5 have a very small compartment. This is actually very large and very comparable to the Tesla Model Y. And the other nice thing that this vehicle comes with that the others don't is a drain plug. Yes, yeah, so you can fill up this entire front end with ice. And if you're at a tailgate, or since this isn't really the tail end of the car, a front gate, I don't know how you would call that, 
but once that ice melts, you can actually just drain it out of the front and it will leak out through the bottom of the vehicle. Another funny thing to talk about is this vehicle is so American, you have two cup holders located under the front. If that's not enough evidence that this is an American vehicle, then I don't really know what else is. One cool feature to point out is you have this electrified Mustang emblem located under the front. Nobody's ever really gonna see that, but it's still a nice touch from Ford. One comment I will make is when you're shutting this hood latch, you kind of actually have to use a little bit of force because you can't just place it on the surface and then push down on it to lock it in place because it doesn't actually do that. It will bounce right back up and you have to actually go inside the vehicle and pull on the latch again just to shut it. So as you can see right here, I cannot actually close the hood if I didn't slam it shut. So just make sure you use a little bit more effort when you're closing this hood. That way it actually locks in place. Now, just in case the front is a little bit of a hassle to open and close and you need more than 4.7 cubic feet of space, well, the Mustang Mach-E comes with a power lift gate and with the back seats up, you have about 29.7 cubic feet of space located behind the second row. And then if you put down the second row, you get a whopping 59.7 cubic feet. So it's not a gigantic amount of space, but considering this is a sloping roof coupe-like crossover, that's really not a bad amount of space to have. Now, if you do want a little bit more space in the back, you can actually lower this floor over here a little bit more. That way you get a little bit more height. Now there's not much more to discuss underneath the trunk floor, aside from a little air compressor that you can use to inflate the tires since this vehicle does not come with a spare tire. And then you have a little storage spot where you can put some towels or some other things that you can hide out of plain sight. Now on this lift gate, you do also get this flexible type of material that actually covers the surface. So if you do have some weird shaped box or something that's gonna be a little bit taller, it doesn't actually damage damage this cover over here, but you could still keep things private and at the same time be able to shut your tailgate. Okay, now let's talk about some of the design aspects that separate the GT and the GT Performance from all of the other trim levels. All right, well, first and foremost, the GT trim level is the only one that gets this cool looking fake front grille. All of the other versions of the Mach-E have this somewhat outline that goes around the edge of what would appear to be a grill, but it's mostly painted the same color as the rest of the body. In this one, it's a little bit different because this actually looks like it's a true grill, even though it is not. This is just a piece of plastic or painted material that has this cool like hexagonish shape to it, similar to what you would find on a regular internal combustion engine, but it really does not need it because this is an electric motor. Another big differentiator between the Mach-E GT versus all of the other trim levels is this Mustang horse emblem actually lights up at night. None of the other versions of this vehicle vehicle have that as an option. So if you do see that light up emblem, then that's a clear telltale sign that this is a GT version of the vehicle and not just your regular Mustang Mach-E. All Mustang Mach-E's come with LED headlights, but if you get the GT, you get a projector style headlight, which looks just a little bit nicer. And you also do get sequential turn light signals, which I'll show you on the screen right now. You do also get this air inlet over here that provides a nice curtain over the side of the front two wheels, and it just gives it a really nice aggressive front end look to it. Overall, the Mach-E GT does have a very Mustang inspired look to it, especially with these two hood bulges that go right across the front, giving it this really mean stance to it. Very reminiscent of a Mustang. Down here at the bottom, you do have active aero. So these little flaps actually open and close depending on what conditions you're in and to provide the best aerodynamics and the best performance and handling. Now, another major difference between the GT and the other vehicles that may not be as noticeable when you're driving down the road is the fact that the GT actually sits about 10 million millimeters lower than the regular trim level Mustang Mach-E. And coming over to the back, the GTs will all have this cool GT emblem. The other ones will just have the pony badge. Another point to make on this roof line over here is all GT models come with a black painted roof as you can see right there, versus the other vehicles which come with the same color as the rest of the body. Now, another thing to note is this line over here that stretches across and gives this cool kind of fake appearance as if the roof is sloping down even when it's not. This section is always black regardless of what trim level you get, but the roof itself is typically body painted color aside from the GT version. And while we're back here, let me show you what that looks like with that sloping roof line. They did a really cool aesthetic job to it, making it look almost like a coupe 
coupe rather than a traditional crossover or SUV. And that really helps make it look more like a Mustang and at the same time not sacrifice the interior headroom because your head is likely somewhere around this section inside of the cabin and that's aided by the fact that this is a black painted plastic rather than the body painted color. Now, like I mentioned in the beginning of the video, this is the GT Performance Edition. It's about a $6,000 option. So what exactly does that change aside from adding about 34 pound-feet of torque and shaving about three tenths of a second off of the zero to 60 time. Well, one way to be able to tell the difference between a regular GT and the GT Performance has to do with the wheels. Now, these wheels are much better looking, arguably, than the regular GT version. A lot of people do not like the flower look to the regular GT wheels. If I find some, I'm gonna put them up on the screen right now so you guys can tell the difference of what I'm saying. They're both 20 inches, but the design on the GT Performance looks a lot better. And if you take a look at the Brembos, these are actually labeled Brembos versus the regular GT that does not have that label there. Another thing to note is all GT Performance Edition vehicles come with these vehicle specific Pirelli P0 summer tires that are 245 millimeters wide on all four wheels. Now, the GT Performance Edition also includes the Magna Ride suspension. So that makes this vehicle a little bit more adaptive, a little bit more comfortable driving down the road as compared to the regular GT. And just for ride quality alone, it may be worth upgrading to the GT Performance Edition because of that Magna Ride suspension. Now, if for some reason the performance specs, the wheels and tires, and the Magna Ride suspension isn't enough to convince you to get the GT Performance Edition, well, the interior is a little bit more custom as well. These interior seats are actually custom and specific to the GT Performance Edition. And as you can see, they are very aggressive and beautiful looking seats. You have this unique looking seat back that actually wraps around your shoulders and gives you a little bit tighter bolstering as compared to the regular GT. And you have this cool like racing stripe pattern to it that's kind of hard to tell, but at certain angles you can see you've got two racing stripes going down the middle of the seat. But if you're right above it, it's not as noticeable. It's really more noticeable on the side and it goes all the way up. The same pattern applies to the rear seats as well so they didn't skimp out on the back and it's a really nice looking cool touch to it that gives it this Mustang inspired theme to it. The only real complaint I have with the seats on this GT Performance Edition is the fact that they only come in this color. It's actually called Active X Gray and even though it fits really well into the interior of the vehicle I do wish they had some other funkier colors specific to the GT Performance Edition since that's supposed to be the more powerful performance inspired variant and perhaps that's something they're gonna add in the future but I do wish that was an option out of the gate okay now let's get out of this horribly windy weather and talk about some of the cool interior features first and foremost let's talk about how to get into the vehicle and there's a couple different ways okay now one way to do that is using a traditional key fob now if you guys have used Ford products in the past you'll notice this key looks very similar to all other Ford products what's nice about this one is you do have this Mustang emblem on the back now the second way you can get into to this vehicle is using your smartphone. Uh, yes, you can use the Ford Pass app and control a lot of different features on this vehicle just using your phone. I mentioned this a little bit earlier when I talked about opening the frunk using your phone, but you can open up the tailgate, you can lock and unlock the vehicle, open the windows and so much more functionality just using your phone. And then you can use your phone as your key fob just to enter into the vehicle. Now, another way you can enter into the vehicle if for some reason you left your key fob at home and your phone battery died, well, you do have this smart touch system that is not new for the Mustang Mach-E. In fact, Ford has been using the system for, I wanna say a couple decades at this point. And you can use a specific pin number that you input inside of the infotainment screen. And then you can actually either leave the key fob inside of the vehicle or you can leave it at home and then when you approach the vehicle you just punch in your keypad and the vehicle will automatically unlock. Okay now that we've discussed how to unlock the vehicle let's discuss how to actually get inside because as I'm sure you can notice there are no door handles on this vehicle so how exactly do you enter into the car? Well first and foremost you do push this button to unlock the vehicle and as I'm sure you can see it pops open about an inch or two to allow you to enter the vehicle. Now in order to open it you can either pull on this little handle that's located right below that button and enter into the cabin or what you could do is push that button and actually reach your hand behind the door panel and open the door that way. So there are two ways to enter it but probably the most common used way is using this little notch that sticks out 
underneath the button itself. Now you may be wondering how do you enter into the back because there's no little notch here for you to be able to open it and hold on to it. So when you push this button similar to the front, the door does pop open the same one or two inches, but instead of using this little handle located underneath the button, you can actually reach behind the door itself and open it up. Now, as I'm sure you can see, Ford actually added this rubberized material so you're able to grip onto the door and open it without slipping off of the paint like you would expect if you were going to open the door. Ford says it did this without adding a little handle over here because they found that when they were doing user testing, a lot of people would not use this handle. I suspect because it's a little bit tall and high up here versus this being kind of closer to your torso height, you're able to swing it open. I don't suspect a child getting into and out of the back seat to be able to reach a handle located about four feet high. Now, another very interesting and smart design that Ford integrated into the Mach-E is you may have a concern that if this door opens about an inch or two and you happen to reach your hand behind the door, and accidentally push it in, you're going to sever your finger. Well, Ford actually thought ahead and realized that that could be a concern. And what they decided to do was they actually have this little motorized arm that pops out just ever so slightly. So when you do push that button and the door opens a couple inches, that little peg actually prevents the door from shutting back into its locked position. So as I'm sure you can tell, I'm pushing on the door and the door is not closing. But once you open it a little bit more than an inch, you'll actually hear the noise of the electric motor pushing that little peg back into its spot and then you can actually close the door. The same applies for the rear seats, which may be even more important since they do not have a little handle to open the door. And as you can see, I'm pushing on the door and it is not shutting. Very smart ingenuity and a lot of things they really had to think of in order to remove something so simple as a door handle. Okay, now the wait is finally over and we're getting into the vehicle as I'm sure you're just dying to find out what it looks like. First and foremost, I wanna discuss the door panel and the materials. Up here, you have this very nice soft touch kind of fake vinyl leather look to it. You have this Alcantara fake suede look to it that also a very nice feature. And you have some storage capabilities down in this cubby with some bottle holders and a place for some loose change or maybe your smartphone over there. One cool feature to talk about on this door is to actually open the door, you pull on this little latch over here. Now let's get inside of the cabin and get out of this windy weather and discuss some of the cool features on the interior. First, you'll notice this really cool graphic as you get in and then you have this electrified Ford emblem that just charges up and it's a really cool like movie theater trailer to the vehicle. Okay, now sitting in these seats, they're actually extremely comfortable. Typically when you get into performance styled seats, they may be uncomfortable or kind of digging in in the wrong places. This thing actually hugs you in place very well. I actually prefer sitting in these seats versus the regular Mustang Mach-E because they hug you in place a little bit more and are a little bit more comfortable. Moving in from the door, you do have your typical Ford buttons over here for your automatic headlights and the brightness on your instrument cluster. And then you also have a traction control off button, which is very nice to have over here, especially for this GT Performance Edition, because I have a feeling you're probably gonna use this button every now and then. Moving up from here, you have these same nice materials that spread all across the interior cabin. You have this nice Alcantara leather over here that gives it a really nice premium look to it. And this material almost has this kind of 3D-like texture to it, as I'm sure you can tell on the camera as it focuses. Going up a little bit further, you do have this nice Bang & Olufsen sound system. So if you do get the GT Performance Edition, you do get the 10 speaker Bang & Olufsen sound system, which does look really nice with this cool sound bar look to it located on the front. It's almost like you're sitting in a movie theater. Moving over to the steering wheel, there's really not much to discuss here. You do have that Mustang Mach-E emblem. On the left side, you do have some of your adaptive cruise control, regular cruise control, and lane keep assist options. On the right hand side, you have your voice activation and some of your radio and multimedia controls. Coming up from the steering wheel, you'll see these lights that are blinking left and right. And those are actually not blinking for me. That's just the way the camera captures it using the frame rates. But this is where you have a lot of your blue cruise system from Ford. And what that system does is on certain highways here throughout the United States, this vehicle will actually monitor your eyes and make sure your head is facing forward, paying attention to the road. And once it notices that you're actually paying attention, you can actually remove your hands from the steering wheel. And this vehicle will navigate, accelerate, decelerate, all across that highway without your input whatsoever. It is almost like an autopilot or self-driving feature, but it is only on pre-mapped highways. And then moving up a little bit further, this is really what differentiates this vehicle from the Tesla, and that is 
an actual infotainment screen. This is actually a 10.2 inch infotainment screen. And even though it's pretty basic for the most part, it provides everything you need to know from your charge and how much range you have left, all the way to your speedometer, your mileage, what gear you're in. All of the need to know information is located right above the steering wheel. And if it's perfectly between the 10 and two notches of the steering wheel. Now let's talk about this creme de la creme 15.5 inch giant display. There are some cool things like you do have all your climate control features down at the bottom, which has these cool graphics that you can you know, swipe up and down on, and you do have a heated steering wheel. No ventilated seat option in this vehicle, and you do not get heated or cooled seats in the back either. I do want to briefly talk about this cool volume knob over here, and if you push the button, there's this cool graphic that extends past this volume knob. This volume knob is actually integrated directly onto the screen. So uh, Ford says this is a first of its kind type of technology where they actually molded this directly onto the display and it's not actually above it or floating beyond it. It's actually attached directly to the screen. So that is a pretty cool piece of technology that Ford created and it's nice to see that in this application. Moving further upwards, this is kind of the main home screen where you have all the different options. This vehicle does come with Android Auto and Apple CarPlay and they are wireless or wired. That's a main advantage over Tesla because they don't have either option. You do also have this cool little sketch feature. So if you are standing at a stoplight or perhaps you're charging the vehicle, you can actually play around and maybe have your kids play around and do some sketches on here. And you can even go and do like a tic-tac-toe. I wasn't able to find any type of games like uh, a racing game that you can use your steering wheel or anything like that similar to what Tesla has. And I also don't think you can get Netflix or any other streaming services using the system, but that may be an over the air update in the future. One thing I wanted to mention about this e-heat option is it actually uses a supplemental electric heater to warm the cabin before the car can make its own heat. So disabling this will actually extend your battery life, but at the same time, that way you can in colder climate be able to use the heating option and heat up the interior of the vehicle before actually getting inside the car. One nice feature I wanna talk about is using the navigation system you can actually find your closest charging station and not only will it show you where they're located but it'll also give you some need to know information like what kind of connectors they have how long it takes to charge what type of kilowatt hours and all of the need to know info for you to be able to make sure you plan out your journey with enough charge left to be able to get to your destination this vehicle is equipped with a 360 degree camera where you can actually zoom in to all of the different quadrants and look at all of the different angles and the sensors even the base mustang maki that with tax credits is around $37,000, comes packed with a lot of cool safety features so you don't have to compromise safety for MSRP. You can kind of get the best of both worlds. The vehicle also comes with a wireless charging pad. You have two different types of USB ports on this front row and behind the center console over here. Moving back from these front two cup holders, you have your gear selector, which is just your traditional rotary knob. You do have your automatic parking brake feature and you have your hazard lights and this is your parking sensors and it'll automatically bring up the settings up on the screen. Coming back here, this is obviously a GT version as you can see on the center armrest, which does lift up kind of has this modern minimalistic look to it. Moving further down, you do have this slide out cover over here that reveals a pretty large spot for you to be able to put some of your stuff into. And it does have this 12 volt cigarette lighter adapter so you can charge other electronics. Uh, and you do have a little coin holder here as well. And the creme de la creme aside from this infotainment screen is this giant fixed glass panoramic roof. And I gotta say it's very, very beautiful, really nice looking, really makes this interior a little bit more air area brighter and from what I've been told by the owner it actually heats up the car pretty well so in this cold winter climate that we're in you don't have to use your climate controls often because you can just use the sunlight now while we're up here I also want to talk about the three different driving modes you have you've actually got four but we'll talk about that one in just a second you have the whisper mode which is kind of like an eco mode on any other vehicle you've got your engage which is kind of a good mix between sport and regular so likely you're going to be driving in engage for most of the period Period. And then when you take this to a drag strip or a track, you're probably going to use the unbridled mode, which is kind of like a sport mode. And there is an additional option, which is the unbridled extend. Now this is specific for track days and autocross events. And it's actually grayed out right now because there's only certain conditions where this vehicle will turn this feature back on. So what it does is it actually puts a lot more power to the rear. So it becomes a rear biased vehicle. But when it does this, it also extends the amount of range that this vehicle has. So if you're 
you're taking it to a track day, you're gonna wanna use unbridled extend because that way you're able to get more consistent runs time after time and be able to run the race or run the track day a lot longer than you would in just the unbridled mode. Coming over to the back, there's really not that much more to discuss other than it being a very comfortable place to sit. I really love how this panoramic roof just flows along the top, giving it a nice, bright, cool feel to it. And I really like this little curve over here and it makes it just look kind of like a spaceship from the inside. The same cool materials carry out through the back. You have this nice soft touch leather up here. You get the same Alcantara suede. The door handle is exactly the same with this pole style lever to open it up. Now, when it comes to legroom, you actually get about 38 inches of legroom behind the first row. So that's actually pretty decent considering this is a smaller sized crossover. You also get rear air vents as well. You've got a couple more USB ports like I mentioned. And if you bring down this center arm console, you'd get two additional cup holders back here. And then you also have additional water bottle space located in the storage bin below the door handles. Other than that, my headroom is actually fantastic. There's a lot more room than you would expect because the roof line actually kind of comes down over here. So it'd be cutting into my head. But since you have the black molded plastic making it look a little bit taller, you have probably about two or three inches of headroom above me and I'm about five foot nine. Now it's time to do something I've wanted to do since I started this car review and that is get into the car and drive it. Does this vehicle live up to its Mustang heritage and how does it really handle? What does three and a half zero to 60 feel like in an electric vehicle? Okay, setting off in the Ford Mustang Mach-E GT Performance Edition. It's a pretty long name. Let's take this vehicle for a drive. Now, it's hard to know if the vehicle is on. It does make a little whooshing sound is the best I can explain it. But uh, let's put it in drive here. And let me quickly go to the drive modes because I'm certain I'm going to use them throughout the test drive. Okay, first impressions driving around in the parking lot with this vehicle. Uh, it drives very similar to pretty much any other car you might not even be able to tell that it is an electric vehicle. All right, so we're about to set off on this road in the engage mode, which is kind of your, like I said, middle of the road mode. It's not the sport, it's not the whisper. Wow. Okay, uh, we just got to 35 miles an hour in about one second. That is crazy. I even felt a little bit of torque steer coming from the front end, which is really odd to feel in an electric vehicle. I've never felt that in an electric car before. Now, setting off on this road, let's talk about road noise. Honestly, this is just as quiet as any other internal combustion engine. I'm really not hearing a big difference between the two, but even on this super windy day, you can barely hear any of the wind noise. Okay, we're gonna do another quick pull here and see how it feels. Okay, that is a rocket ship. That is insane. I have never felt that much power outside of an electric vehicle. Even the Model 3 that I tested, that was kind of a mid-range at zero to 60, around four and a half seconds. This thing is way more powerful than that, as it should, because it costs a lot more money. Now, it's hard for me to compare this to a Tesla Model Y because I've, I haven't driven one yet, but I imagine it's got a very similar zero to 60 time. And what I will say is, this is way more than enough power. And even with these amazing summer tires, I still feel a little bit of wheel slippage, as crazy as that sounds. Now let's put it into unbridled mode and let's see how big of a difference that actually makes. Wow, I mean, it, 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 it's an insane. You know what, what's crazy about this is with the amount of wheel spin you actually get out of this car, it almost does feel like a muscle car. And I know I'm going to be harassed in the comments for saying this, but it does not feel like your typical all wheel drive, you know, Audi SQ5 or something like that, or, or something with a lot of performance. This feels like at any moment it can lose traction and slam you against the wall. And that is what a muscle car is. It's not meant to be the most perfect in straight line acceleration. It's meant to be the funnest in straight line acceleration. And this vehicle really does accomplish that. I was honestly a little bit scared on mashing on the pedal because I knew that, oh my God, that's insane. I mean, that this car is so easy to break the speed limit that Within a second, you can easily be breaking the law, but 
Anyways, as I was saying, this car does have that little bit of fear inspiring passion to it where you don't know exactly where it's headed because of that torque steer and because the wheels actually lose grip. And this is considering these are summer tires, they're Pirelli P0s, they're fantastic tires. And even with that in mind, this vehicle still loses traction. And man, this thing is really, really fun to drive. I mean, it no lag whatsoever. I mean, there's no downshift. It just instantly provides that power when you just push on the pedal. It's insane. Wow, this is fantastic. I'm gonna put it in whisper and see if there's any difference. I did notice it got a little bit quieter. It almost does feel like it reduces the power a little bit when it comes to whisper and I mean, it's still insanely quick. Like, the, you know, even if in whisper or unbridled or engage, it's not like it all of a sudden becomes a slow vehicle. It's still incredibly quick. It just might be a little bit quieter and a little bit more range focused than the typical unbridled mode. Let's see if we can go around these vehicles real quick. Yeah, I mean, e even in whisper mode, this thing is more power than anybody ever needs. Now I'm using one pedal drive at the moment and seeing how it feels. And uh, I can definitely tell the regen braking is on. Uh, this is an example of me taking off my foot off the pedal and I'm coming down about 10 miles an hour. So I can accelerate real quick and then let off the pedal. And it takes about five seconds, but it lowers it by about 10 miles an hour. So it doesn't seem to be super aggressive. I think in the Tesla that I reviewed a few years ago, I think the regen braking was a little bit stronger than this, but I honestly think I prefer this one. So I didn't even push the brake pedal at all. It actually braked on its own, as you saw with, with just that 20 feet of space. Uh, so that's really nice to have. It does take getting used to, but I do think this is a little bit better than the aggressive regen that you get on the Tesla. Let's see if we turn off the propulsion sound. Honestly, then you really can't tell what's going on. Uh, it, it's still super quiet. I can't say the propulsion mode really makes a huge difference. Uh, it makes it maybe a little bit, maybe like two decibels louder. But if you want the quietest electric vehicle, I would say turn the propulsion sound off. And then if you have kids in the back and you want to accelerate, uh, that way they're not annoyed with you constantly accelerating. Okay, we'll do one more acceleration, but I'm honestly getting a little bit motion sick because of how powerful this car is. So let me put it in unbridled mode once more. Yeah, that is an insane amount of power. I even got some wheel chirp from the front end and I'm honestly getting motion sick. I think that's my one complaint with electric vehicles is for some reason, because they are so quick and so powerful that it almost feels like you're in a roller coaster. And if you do get motion sick riding in roller coasters, you're likely gonna get motion sick in an electric vehicle. Wow, I mean, it just, it just propels forward without any difficulty or any struggle. Uh, this vehicle is really amazing. All right, well, there you have it, folks. I'm still recovering from my nausea from the acceleration of this vehicle. But when I started this review, I thought I would have a few complaints about this vehicle, uh, some of which include the door handles because it does seem like it'd be a little bit awkward. It takes a little bit getting used to just to have to push a button and then open it. You know, nothing's wrong with traditional door handles. And so I thought I would have complaints against that. I honestly thought I would have complaints against this windshield wiper, seeing as how it's a pretty big bulky piece of plastic and I wish they integrated it up here behind the rear spoiler. I thought I would have complaints in regards to the frunk and how easy it is to open and close and considering the fact that you have to pretty much go back inside the cabin just to unlock it or have to pull out your phone. I thought I would complain about the fact that the steering wheel requires a manual tilt and telescoping and does not have the option for $70,000 to use a motorized button to tilt and telescope the wheel. I thought I would have complaints about the fact that this vehicle doesn't really have like a performance pages where it shows you your zero to 60 time, your track times. And I definitely thought I would have complaints about the fact that this vehicle cuts power after five seconds of hard acceleration in order to conserve the motors and the battery life and the battery integrity. But as a matter of fact, I have complaints about none of that. After sitting in this car and driving in it, I highly recommend anybody who is skeptical about this vehicle to take it for a test drive and see how it drives. It really will change your mind and it really is an amazing and formidable competitor to the Tesla Model Y performance. Now, I really do wish that they did update the over the air software to 
not limit this vehicle to five seconds of hardline acceleration because if you do take this vehicle to a drag strip you're likely going to lose because after five seconds the vehicle just shuts off power and that's really not something you would expect from a mustang gt let alone the gt performance so maybe that's something ford will improve and that is really a big leg up for tesla model y because it does not cut performance after five seconds of hard acceleration but nonetheless me driving it just around the block i was already getting motion sick after driving driving it for three seconds of hardline acceleration, let alone five seconds. So you're probably not ever gonna reach those limits, but it would be nice to have that as an option if you do take it to a drag strip. Once again, I wanna give a huge thank you to Ken Garf West Valley Ford for giving me the opportunity to review this vehicle for you all today. I had an absolute blast filming this car and I've been waiting to do this for a very long time ever since this vehicle was initially released a couple years ago. If this is your first time stopping by, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to the channel, as the car said, for all of the weekly car videos and also find me on all of the social media at Schwazy underscore. As always, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you stay Schwazy, stay healthy and have a wonderful day.